Hi there, Mr. Mechnick. Here's a little podcast on the nature of science. So this is kind of your introductory uh, lesson on how science operates. Beginning of every good science class, there's always going to be a discussion about the nature of science and how science operates. So to begin with, I guess the first question to ask yourself is, how would you define science? You know, and science can be defined in a variety of ways, but we can think of science as a system that we utilize to answer questions. It's a way that we can study the world around us. It gives us answers to questions. It explains phenomena on this planet. So it gives us a process. Much of what we do in science is based upon a process to get to an answer. So when we talk about doing experiments in science class, we want to use the scientific method or some type of method uh, to get to an answer. So it, again, it provides us with answers, possible answers to questions. And we can think of science as two general areas. Basic science. So basic science tells us how things work. It's very useful when we try to understand concepts in science and it really helps us develop scientific theories and applied science is using this information that we have learned and running controlled experiments so applying scientific knowledge to answer questions that we aren't familiar with so when we go about answering questions in a biology class we can basically do different types of research much of our lab work that we do in class revolves around one of the two types. So we can do what's known as basic research or we can do applied research. Basic research is referring to research that is made on observations. It allows us to understand or develop an understanding of how something works. So if we wanted to understand um, how glucose, a simple sugar, is utilized in biological systems, uh, we can make some observations about how our body utilizes glucose, how it's transported through our digestive system, into our bloodstream, into our cells, and we can understand the process of taking glucose in and transporting it and utilizing it in our cells for energy. Now this is again basic research. We could conduct experiments to make these observations to understand how this works. We would do experiments that we can't control and a lot of times the research that's being done is is still going to have a purpose or an objective uh, there's going to be some procedure in place and it would have to eliminate biases so we can develop an understanding an accurate understanding of how that concept works so now if people understand the concept of glucose distribution to our cells and how we utilize glucose in our cells to make ATP so our muscles can expand and contract so we can think and so we can walk and so we can jump so we can do all these different activities we could actually conduct research to understand how people that are diabetic have a difficult time regulating the amount of glucose in their blood so we could study diabetic patients and we could control their amount of sugar in their blood. We could actually uh, do some experimentation to see when insulin would be needed and when insulin is not needed, when their blood sugar goes up, when their blood sugar goes down. So we could actually run a variety of uh, controlled experiments where we would identify variables. We could test out a hypothesis and we could have some control groups. So very often in science classes we do applied research. You know since probably fifth grade science class you conducted experiments um, using applied research methodology where you would set up an experiment, identify what the variables are, and then test that variable against another variable to see how it made a difference. So applied research is applying scientific concepts to actually conduct a controlled experiment. So when we talk about a controlled experiment in biology or in science, we're, we really are talking about manipulating or changing variables to see how that affects the, the outcome. So a variable is simply part of the experiment that is changed. And a good experiment will always have three types of variables. There's other types of variables that we're not going to talk about in this podcast, 
but this is mainly a review of things that you should have learned in Science 9. And I know that you learned them in Science 9 because those Science 9 teachers did a great job teaching you about independent, dependent, and controlled variables. So if you want to fast forward, this would be the time if you feel you have a pretty good understanding of these three concepts. But if you want a little refresher, here we go. Independent variable. This is the manipulated variable, the variable that can be changed during an experiment. This is what you as a student would manipulate to see how it affects the dependent variable. So in an experiment where we wanted to test how different types of fertilizer affect plant growth, we could alter the plants into different environments with different fertilizers. And we could then use the independent variable as the different types of fertilizer and our dependent variable would be how the plants actually grow. So the dependent is the outcome. This is what you are measuring in the experiment. So if you're going to measure the height of the plant or the growth rate of the plant, that would be your dependent variable. And you could treat the different plants with your different types of fertilizer, which is your independent, and we are going to measure the outcome. So how did fertilizer one versus fertilizer two versus no fertilizer affect the growth. So your independent variable would be the type of fertilizer and your dependent variable is the growth rate or the growth of that plant. But to make it an accurate, reliable experiment, we need to make sure that we have many controls in place. Good scientists identify as many controls as possible before they run their experiment. So we want to make sure in all of our experiments that we do in science class that we identify as many constants as possible. The more things you can control, the more reliable your data is. The more reliable your data is, the more valid your experiment becomes. So in a good experiment, it's what we make sure that we keep the same. It's the variable that is not allowed to change for every single experiment. So here's three practice problems. Why don't you pause this at this point and go through and see if you can answer the three questions that I have posed right here. All right, welcome back. Uh, to wrap up this podcast, we're just going to talk a little bit about scientific process and how we get to that answer. So when we develop a question to an experiment, we want to next gather a lot of background information and develop a hypothesis. The hypothesis is something that we can actually test for. So you're going to make some type of prediction, and this prediction should be based upon lots and lots of prior knowledge. Sometimes students want to jump to predicting before they have necessary background information or knowledge to help them answer that question accurately. So making a testable hypothesis is the basically the third step in doing the scientific method. So identify your problem, gather background information, develop a hypothesis. Once you have your hypothesis, you're going to develop a method or a procedure to conduct your experiment. And in that procedure, you're going to identify all of those variables. You're going to identify your independent, your dependent variable. You're going to identify all those controls. And you're going to conduct your experiment. And it's very important as a good student in science class that your experiment is repeated multiple times. So repeating the experiment, again, will make your, make your results much more reliable if you are able to repeat your experiment and your data is consistent. So when you record your data, you're going to make sure that you have very organized data tables. Again, Science 9 teachers do a great job of making you and forcing you to make lots and lots of data tables. So this is something I expect that you should be pretty good at. Once you have your data recorded from the experiment and you conducted all of your trials, you want to take all of that raw data and you want to reduce it into its simple form, uh, the best measure of that central tendency. So it could be a simplified data table. It could be in the form of a graph. 
We'll talk more about graphing and what type of graph to use based upon the data, but you want to simplify it as much as possible so it tells a story. What, what did you learn by growing these plants with three different fertilizers? We want to look for patterns and relationships. Uh, we want to utilize that graph. We want to apply some statistics to our data so we can make sense out of that so we can ultimately draw some type of conclusion. And when we draw conclusions in science, I like to typically use the claim evidence reasoning, reasoning format so it gives you some structure and assistance in formulating a proper conclusion. So your claim is basically the answer to that original question. Did a fertilizer, did a different type of fertilizer have an effect on the plant growth? And we can answer that. Yes, fertilizer one was better at growing plants. What's your support, your evidence? Well, you're going to use the data that you collected and cite specific examples that will show for sure with 100% certainty that your claim is supported. And why did fertilizer one do better? You should be able to de develop a possible explanation or reasoning for that. And then why is this all important? You discuss future implications. Why is that research really important? And then last, let's communicate that information out so other scientists can look at it and you can communicate that either in a conference or in some type of presentation or publish your findings. Well, thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, that's the end of the show right now. Um, I will have a little bit more on another future podcast on the difference between hypothesis and theory. So at this point, you can close up your notes and bring them to class tomorrow and we'll go through many more practice examples.